And welcome. I am Rob Chatfield, President and CEO of the Free to Choose Network. If Free to Choose sounds familiar, it's because we are the people who brought you Milton Friedman's Free to Choose original series on PBS over 40 years ago, still going strong today. Today, we welcome you to our latest production it is Corporate Welfare. Where's the outrage? You're going to watch the entire film today. So it's going to be a one hour film. If you haven't got your popcorn and soda yet, go ahead and grab that and sit back, relax and enjoy the production there. I'd like to show you the two people, though, who I'm with today. Uh, John Allison is the retired CEO of BB&T Bank. I think it's now called Truist, John. And uh, John is also a retired CEO and president of the Cato Institute. John had a front row seat to see what corporate welfare looked like for sure during the Great Recession time frame. You'll see that in the film and get a chance to ask John some questions afterwards. And Joe Norberg is the host of this film. Joe Norberg is a host of many of our films, by the way, at Free to Choose Network, because he is our executive editor. He is also a senior fellow at the Cato Institute. He's an author, a lecturer, a documentary filmmaker, and one of our favorite people. I'm going to tell you that on the right side of my screen, anyway, there's a chat box. We encourage you to go ahead, use that chat box during the film, too. If there's questions you want to ask, things you want to discuss during the film uh, that you don't want to forget about, you can go ahead and populate that during the film. We'll be happy to take questions after the fact here. The corporate welfare film itself started uh, essentially as a, a, an offshoot from a book by Phil Harvey and Lisa Conyers called Welfare for the Rich. As we were reading that book, we thought, yeah, this is something here that needs to have further discussion upon. And with that, and without further ado, I'm going to ask our technician to go ahead and hit the play button, sit back, relax, as I said, enjoy the film.
more money from around the world is coming through Louisiana than almost anywhere else in the country. And you're like, okay, where is that money going? It's not going to my schools. It's not going to my roads. So what's happening? Ikea said, oh, we're interested in coming to the Memphis area. They also said, well, how much money are you going to give us before we decide whether we're going to come or not? We're paying for them to build luxury condos for the wealthy. This was not done democratically, and it was not done for the kids and the working people. It was done by a small group of people so that they could economically benefit $6 billion. Monies that could be flowing directly into classrooms and communities are somehow given as breaks to those who really don't need a break. They saw a small farm raising food locally. That gets people questioning a lot about what happens in industrial agriculture. But when you uncover what happened here, it's all about eliminating competition. Our money is going to these billionaires in order to give them a competitive advantage. It is really the antithesis of what capitalism should be. This is basically socialism for the rich. Funding for this program has been provided by Sarah Scaife Foundation, Melvin S. Cohen Foundation, Family Mullenkamp Charitable Fund of the Pittsburgh Foundation. Every year, billions of tax dollars are handed out to businesses that don't need it. That's your money. My name is Joan Norberg, and I've studied and written about the relationship between businesses and government around the world, most recently here in America. Your tax dollars are given to some of the largest companies in the world, and often given with little accountability. That's why some call it corporate welfare. America's corporate welfare system, with its tax exemptions, subsidies, and bailouts, is complex, but we'll tackle it head on, and we'll meet some people whose lives and livelihoods have been directly affected by these bloated programs. The individuals who pay the price. And you'll ask yourself, Where's the outrage? Louisiana is a very rich state with poor people. In the county of East Baton Rouge, Louisiana, more than 19% of all residents live in poverty. At the same time, many of the world's largest oil and petrochemical companies are here. In fact, the GDP of this one county is larger than 94 countries in the world. In the last 12 years, we've been a number one or number two state for foreign and direct investment, which means more money from around the world is coming through Louisiana than almost anywhere else in the country. And you're like, okay, where is that money going? Because it's not going to me. It's not going to my schools. It's not going to my roads. So what's happening? A main reason that money isn't reinvested in these local communities is the massive tax exemptions given to select companies operating here. Beginning in the 1930s, the Industrial Tax Exemption Program, or ITEP, allowed select large companies to escape property taxes. The intent of the law really was to encourage manufacturers either to locate here or expand their plants and create new jobs. And the idea was that you would get the exemption for 10 years. At the end of the 10 years, then that property would go on the tax rolls. But as so often happens with government programs, after more than 80 years, ITEP exemptions were almost always approved for extension. Predictably, large petrochemical companies came to count on these massive property tax exemptions. I'd like to call to order the regular meeting for Thursday, November 15th. Unlike other states, Louisiana excluded local communities from having a say in the process. Everything was decided by the State Board of Commerce and Industry. It was just rubber stamped by the State Board of Commerce and Industry. And there was no accountability or verification of any job creation. All in favor indicate with an aye. Aye. Our local school system is experiencing a deficit. Our school teachers have not received any sort of raises for 10 years.
Then a network of churches and community organizers began a campaign to bring public awareness to the inner workings of ITEP. It was allowed to go on for 83 years because it wasn't in the light of day. When the public knew about it, that's where the outrage came. Monies that could be flowing directly into classrooms and directly into communities and community centers are somehow given as breaks to those who really don't need a break. Governor John Bell Edwards issued an executive order changing how ITEP worked. Now all exemptions are capped at 80% of the property's value. And they have to be approved locally before going to the state board. We're actually going to allow the school board, the police departments, the city councils, they are now allowed to vote on the measures. And so as president of East Baton Rouge Federation of Teachers, I received a seat at the table. I implore you tonight to not make a decision on what's best for jobs for Baton Rouge, but what's best for the students of the East Baton Rouge Parish School System. Thank you. Thank you. Our boys and girls that we're educating today will be a part of the working community one day, and they should want to make sure that these students are ready to take on the jobs that they will need them to do. We love XR. I use the gas. And my wife used to work there. But this time they put their big boy pants on and run their company based on the profits that they make. We've got to fix it. This is broke. Where do we draw the line? It's important to have these businesses, but are we sacrificing the children for that? It's not the fault of Exxon. They're doing their duty to their stakeholders. What is not okay Very is that our politicians and our government officials are allowing things like this to happen. In a dramatic first vote, East Baton Rouge narrowly voted against a multi-million dollar tax exemption for ExxonMobil. Please vote. The motion failed. After hours of debate, the East Baton Rouge School Board voted down a controversial tax break for Exxon last night. It's the first time they've killed the exemption since they've had the authority to vote on the issue. But other counties in Louisiana were fearful that large companies might pack up and leave. So they approved several new exemptions. And hopefully on for time, we find some common ground and common space. Meanwhile, the petrochemical industry keeps pushing to reverse the executive order. The topic remains a key issue in elections. No one said ITEP before three years ago. And now people are talking about it. They're developing opinions about it. Because it's kind of just like bubbling up, I think. It's just getting started. And I think the real reform will start to come down the line. We are not anti-business. We are not anti-manufacturing. But we think everybody should pay their fair share of property taxes to support the good of, the, of a community. In East Baton Rouge Parish, transparency was the key first step, which ultimately forced a change. Property tax exemptions, like those given to big businesses in Louisiana, are also used by many smaller cities to lure select businesses to the area with a promise of increasing local jobs. Cities like Memphis, Tennessee. Memphis is a population of about 650,000. It used to be the cotton capital uh, of the country. Now uh, it is probably most known for FedEx and Elvis Presley. IKEA is a global retailer with over 300 stores in 38 countries. It's the largest furniture retail store in the world. In 2015, IKEA proposed opening a new store in Memphis. IKEA was founded in my home country of Sweden. Here in America, IKEA is best known for meatballs and nearly impossible to pronounce product names. So what happened was IKEA said, oh, we're interested in coming to the Memphis area. We think it'd be a great fit for us. Um, but obviously with that, they also said, well, how much money are you gonna give us before we decide whether we're gonna come or not? 
The city of Memphis has a program called the Economic Development Growth Engine, or EDGE, to entice new businesses to move to the city. One way it does this is by offering large property tax abatements. It did not come without controversy early on. There were people who thought that uh, we were going down a very slippery slope here by offering tax incentives to retailers, which is generally not done. Memphis gave IKEA a $9.5 million tax break over 11 years. And IKEA agreed to create 175 new jobs with an average salary of $41,000 a year. Lines are growing tonight for IKEA's grand opening tomorrow. We believe that we'll see people come from Birmingham and Jackson, Mississippi, you know, from hundreds of miles away, not just for the opening, but on a continuous basis. There was some pushback from other businesses as well. What about us? I mean, we've been here and we, we employ here and we pay taxes here. Uh, where, you know, where is our uh, uh, financial incentives here? Ron Becker is general manager and part owner of the Great American Home Store, another furniture store located in Memphis since 2004. Well, what bothered me was not that Ikea was coming to, to the town, but that the fact that they were going to get a tax abatement equal to almost nine million dollars and just a few short years ago when i went to the city officials they told me that there was no such programs for retail you're really pitting these gigantic corporations who know the government and have tons of lobbyists against mom and pop shops in our community that we're trying to save you're basically asking people to pay more tax dollars in order for their competitor to succeed over them we have about 135 to 140 full-time employees. We pay our people very well. Our income levels meet or exceed anything that IKEA was offering to their people. But gentlemen, y'all ready for that early morning meeting? And if you talk to business owners, they will tell you, look, tax incentives are not the main reason we go somewhere. We go somewhere that has a good workforce, that has good laws, where you have low taxes. And that's what we need to be focused on. Two years after IKEA Memphis opened to much fanfare and millions in tax breaks, new documents show the Swedish furniture retailer doesn't have as many jobs on the site as they promised. The politicians, they want to just get out and say that we have jobs coming in, we have new company that chose Memphis over somebody else. And they like the sound of that as opposed to worrying about something that will happen years down the road. The company committed to create 175 net new jobs. IKEA started 2018 with 175 employees, but ended with 147. IKEA also committed to pay $41,011 annually, and it hasn't met that figure, paying on average $36,021 in 2017 and $36,944 in 2018. I believe in a level playing field. IKEA is a Fortune 500 company. They don't need tax breaks from the government to expand. Smaller businesses create more jobs. There's only one IKEA in Memphis, but there's 15 to 20 independent furniture stores in Memphis. Where's our tax break? I'm standing in front of what used to be King's Furniture, Louis Cadell's store. Less than two years after IKEA opened, King's Furniture went out of business, and Lewis now works in another state. I've always thought of myself as an entrepreneur, and to have to go and empty your building out and take your sign down is like losing a child. These are our tax dollars. We work really hard for them, and they should go to things that we need. They should go to essential government services, roads, schools, police, fire. I mean, that's what this money should go to. I don't. I think it's essentially just not the role of government to give money to big corporations at the expense of small business owners. Many such programs begin with good intentions, but they result in unintended consequences. And there's another risk, blatant abuse. When millions, if not billions, of taxpayer dollars are on the table, there's often enticement for manipulating the system, which usually benefits the wealthy and connected. G. 
Chicago is the third largest city in the U.S. And back in 1984, it decided to rejuvenate districts that were labeled as blighted. To do this, the city instituted a plan called Tax Increment Financing, or TIF. The goal was to spur development in the poor areas of the city. And any increase in property values doesn't go to local governments, doesn't go to schools. It's diverted to economic development. And right now, it's basically at the sole discretion of the mayor on how those funds are used. The basic idea behind TIF was to provide tax funds to encourage developers to build in distressed neighborhoods. TIF programs like this exist in 49 states, but each state differs in exactly how they're administered. These variances make it hard to present TIF as a national problem, but it is. In Chicago, for example, a neighborhood is first designated as blighted. Then that neighborhood's local property tax income is frozen for 23 years. And any future increase in local taxes is taken from the blighted neighborhood and put into the mayor's TIF fund. More than 500 projects in Chicago have received TIF funds. Roughly 50% of the TIF funds are not flowing to these areas uh, that are, you know, quote unquote, blighted, that they're instead going to affluent areas where you have a lot of businesses, where businesses would be investing and, and locating anyway. Since 2006, Chicago public schools have been deprived of $2.5 billion in tax revenues diverted to TIF. Lincoln Yachts is one such TIF project. It's the largest development the city of Chicago has considered in decades. The North Side's $6 billion, 52-acre Lincoln Yards project is one step closer to reality. The mixed-use development is expected to bring in an additional 30,000 residents to an already dense Lincoln Park and Bucktown neighborhoods. Well, I know your mama ain't gonna tell you no more. The Hideout is an historic local music club that lies within the $6 billion Lincoln Yards project. Tim and Katie Tutton have owned the club since the 1990s, and it's been a neighborhood hangout for nearly a hundred years. That bar in the front has been there since the 1880s, and it was always called The Hideout since the license name 1934. It was a community house. The city designated the neighborhood as blighted, Local residents scoffed at the idea. This is actually prime property. We're talking riverfront property. I mean, Lincoln Yards is really sandwiched in between two of the most affluent neighborhoods in Chicago. So this is a thriving business. It's been here for as long as we've been here, 25 years before that. And it exemplifies the type of light manufacturing that's been going on in this neighborhood forever. When you come during the day, you can't find a place to park because there's so many employees. So in this building, it was a beautiful, beautiful brick building. They probably had 10 to 14 employees. The building got sold before we knew it. That weekend, they tore it down. By Sunday, everything was cleared out and hauled away. So it really sent a message that the developers were moving fast. The Lincoln Yards project threatens many of the existing local businesses. But developers told Tim and Katie that they want to preserve the hideout. They said that the hideout was an enticement for the type of clientele they want to attract. And Tim and Katie would get more customers as well. The developers, they have this theme that they constantly say, you're going to make a lot of money. And when they tell us you're going to make money, it's the opposite of the kind of real values that we really hold and cherish. To have a community of people that do things because they love it and they believe in it, that's where you have really depth of a life. We're not against development. We are against the use of public tax dollars that are subsidizing a private luxury development. So the city is being influenced not by what is good for the, the neighborhoods, for all of these people that can't find affordable housing, that live throughout the south and west side of Chicago. It is being driven by wealthy developers who literally got together with our mayor and said, sell us that property, 
We will build luxury condos. It'll be billions of dollars worth. You kick in a billion dollar TIF and we will have this amazing development. And just to put in perspective, the amount we're talking about here, nearly a third of all property tax revenues collected by the city of Chicago are now diverted into TIF districts. Uh, we just set a record, $841 million in TIF districts in the city of Chicago in the most recent year. The property was sold to a developer and then the developer said, now that we bought it, we need a TIF. And the TIF is usually the incentive to get a developer to purchase a property. They knew that money that could go to school children on the south and west side, Anywhere that the economic the development that could save our city. And they decided, no, we don't care about those people. We want it right here in this majority white, wealthy area. We're gonna push through a TIF. The full city council approved the Lincoln Yards project about 15 minutes ago. Activists are vowing to amp up their opposition. Protesters blocked off part of City Hall, and they also packed the hallways on two floors inside. But despite the outrage, a swift decision by the Finance Committee this morning set up the full council votes, which went through as expected. The most frustrating thing about the TIF program is that it enables the pay-to-play politics that are so widespread in, in Chicago. We're taking away money from core government services, we're taking away money from schools and repairing roads and things that, that everybody in the community can use, and we're essentially using that money to uh, offset costs for wealthy, well-connected business interests who really don't need the help. The use of these funds have typically been a slush fund uh, for the mayor of Chicago, both Emanuel and Daley prior to him, to sort of reward people who uh, are politically connected and possibly support their campaigns. This was not done democratically, and it was not done for the majority of the kids and the working people in the South and West Side. It was done by a small group of people so that they could economically benefit $6 billion. These are major decisions being decided by a very small group of people that are motivated by their own personal monetary gain. This is not for the best of our city. It's for the best of a few. And that just is egregious. The TIF program in Chicago is classic corporate welfare in action. So far, our stories have shown corporate welfare operating on the local level. East Baton Rouge Parish, Memphis, Chicago. But guess what happens when the federal government gets involved? America's first agricultural act was passed by Congress in 1933, in the depths of the Great Depression. It's been renewed without fail ever since. We will always stand with the American farmers. Now to the Farm Bill. It was a bipartisan success. In 2018, the 18th iteration of the Farm Bill allocated more than $428 billion in various programs over the next four years. Most of that, 76%, now goes to SNAP, or food stamps, and the remainder goes to agriculture. Over $102 billion. Agricultural production has been shifting to larger farms for decades. In 1991, America's small farms accounted for 46% of the nation's production. But by 2015, that share had fallen to under 25%. The amount of subsidies that the big guys they're getting is so much more than the little guys. When you look at who is getting the money, you find that something like 70% goes to the 10% largest farm. Those subsidies are really complicated. So it's not surprising that it's the big guy who have the resources, not just to lobby in Congress, but to actually have 
entire shops to try to get and maximize the amount of subsidies that they're getting. Sugar is one of the most heavily regulated agricultural programs, with input quotas and pricing determined by the USDA. The Florida-based Van Hool brothers, who control the world's largest sugar refining operation, were once dubbed the first family of corporate welfare by Time magazine. They receive about $65 million in price supports annually. And the Farm Bill sets consumer prices at about twice what the rest of the world pays for sugar. What then could be the purpose of sugar subsidies if high-priced sugar is the guaranteed end result? In 2016, the Fanjul brothers hosted fundraisers for both Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump, presumably to stay in favor with the White House, regardless of who won the election. Some argue that the farm industry faces unique challenges, such as unpredictable and devastating weather events. Farming is a risky business, but it's not any riskier than anything else. If you're in retail, you're exposed to if there's a big snowstorm before Christmas. So this notion that farming is any different than many other uh, industries is, just makes no sense. The U.S. government still treats agricultural subsidies as if they're helping the small farm owner. But that's not the case at all. Most small farms today exist outside of the subsidy system. Greg Gunthorpe is a third-generation farmer. He and his family employ 45 workers on their Indiana farm. We raise uh, pigs, chickens, ducks, and turkeys on the farm. We raise about 2,500 pigs a year. For 20 years, Greg has witnessed how government subsidies influence farm practices. Meat, fruits, and vegetables are not directly subsidized by the U.S. government. The most subsidized crops in the U.S. are corn, soybeans, wheat, cotton, and rice. The shift has been to large acreage farms of these monocrops. Farmers choose to raise corn and soybeans because those are the um, crops that there's government uh, guaranteed uh, revenue insurance. And who benefits from uh, corn prices being low? Uh, you know, large companies that have lots of confinement animals that eat corn and soybeans. It's not the diversified independent family farm. Other farmers in their community have turned to subsidized corn and soybeans. But Greg and his wife remain committed to a diversified farm, including the production of protein. They began to sell directly to restaurants and retail stores. The USDA tells people to eat their um, fruits and vegetables, uh, yet the subsidies all go to items high in fat, high in carbohydrates. We choose not to subsidize fruits and vegetables or clean proteins. Corn is the most subsidized crop of all. Nearly 30% of U.S. corn is converted to ethanol, almost 48% to various forms of animal feed, and 13% is exported. The corn we actually eat is less than 10%, and more than half of that is used to make high fructose corn syrup and sweeteners. If we were going to pay farmers, we should probably choose to pay farmers something that put uh, Americans on a better diet rather than a bad diet. One of the original purposes of the Farm Bill was to ensure a dependable food supply. Today's farm programs fail to address that need, and many of our cities and rural areas have become food deserts, places where fresh food just isn't available. The city suffers from only having convenience stores and gas stations that provide some kind of food products, uh, but it's not enough to give people a nutritional and healthy meal. Pastor Marty Henderson founded Peace Gardens and Farms. The plan is to grow healthy food and make it available for the neighborhood. Several volunteers received Master Gardener certifications from the local university. 
All of these down here are bell peppers. We plan to provide food for 600 families every week. And so we have our work cut out for us. But we're looking forward to stemming this tide of food insecurity in Gary, Indiana. And hey, that's amazing. From that little seed, this is just what comes of it, ain't it? Yeah. Oh, that's pretty good. Yeah. Ain't real, huh? My grandmother sold 35 bunches of collard greens for 15 cents a bunch. That was how she made some money. I didn't know that the seeds for farming were being planted in me when I was a child. Pastor Henderson's farm receives no agricultural subsidies for the food that they grow. They are taking it upon themselves to work towards a solution for the food shortages in their community. As small farms diminish, the remaining large farms mainly serve highly consolidated corporations, many of which are not even American companies. Brazilian meat processor JBS has acquired Swift, Pilgrim's Pride Poultry, Cargill Pork and others becoming the world's largest meat processor. In 2016, the largest pork producer in the US, Chinese-owned Smithfield Foods, increased consumer prices in stores, but decreased the amount they paid farmers for live hogs. Yet, they still benefited from the government subsidy system, heavily lobbying to keep feed prices low. It's estimated that in 2019 alone, Agribusiness spent over $135 million on lobbying. But simply staying free from the farm subsidy system does not protect the farmer from big agriculture influence and pressure. The Hawkins Farm in northeastern Indiana has been a working family farm since 1957. Today, Jeff Hawkins and his son, Zach, continue the tradition. So this is a 99-acre farm in Wabash County, Indiana, and uh, my dad and I farm together. Jeff and Zach raise hogs, cattle, vegetables, and poultry. They sell primarily to families and restaurants in the area. And in the summer, Friday is brick oven pizza night. We embody what people romantically think about when they think about a farm. You know, you know, big corporations put red barns and, you know, cattle out in green pastures, you know, on their labels. And we are that. <laughs> in 2018, more than 9 billion chickens were raised for their meat. About 30 companies control 95% of the $31 billion industry and they process more than 150 million chickens each week. The Hawkins farm processes around 200 birds per week. The state of Indiana grants an exemption that allows small farmers to process their own chickens on the farm, rather than sending them off to a large poultry processor. There are all sorts of regulations that need to be followed. We do a citric acid dip at the end, which helps with microbial issues. And they're put into a poultry chiller, which is a very powerful refrigerator so that pathogens are not allowed to grow. And it's a, a very safe, clean system. And to our knowledge, there has not been one recorded case of foodborne illness from birds that have been butchered under this exemption. And this exemption has been in place for around 50 years. Their chicken is off the chart and uh, we've featured them since day one of the restaurant, basically. Pete Eshelman owns a four-star restaurant in nearby Fort Wayne, Indiana. He also runs his own farm to support the restaurant and buys food from local farmers. In 2015, the Indiana State Legislature invited Jeff and Pete to make a presentation on farmers' markets and local restaurants. And then I'm bragging about Hawkins, and I'm bragging about his chicken that is as 
good as the finest chicken you buy from in France. And he got up and talked about the great partnership. Uh, our next presenter is Jeff Hawkins from Hawkins Family Farms. Um, I come today as a fifth generation Wabash County farmer. My son, who is my partner, is the sixth generation. But that means but is. they were in for a surprise. We finished our presentation and the chair of the committee said, well, that's illegal. So she went to the Indiana State Department of Health and she requested that they um, issue a cease and desist letter. Both the Hawkins Farm and Pete Eshelman's restaurant received the letter. They immediately had to stop selling and serving chickens from the farm. When we first received the letter, I mean, I think it was overwhelming and oh, we felt very helpless. The state attorney general soon declared it was in fact legal for the Hawkins to process chickens on their own farms. It seemed that the issue was resolved. But despite the ruling, certain senators drafted a new law in order to make it illegal. So that's how a hashtag was born. Hashtag keep chicken on the menu. Like you've enjoyed this meal, will you please contact your representative? People were telling us they would call and they actually would lead with, is this about the chicken thing? when they picked up the phone. Not even hello. Yeah. Once again, Jeff, Zach, and Pete head to Indianapolis to testify. They basically came up with a story that small farms processing chicken on the farms is a health risk. Two weeks before we testified, there were, there were two recalls back to back of something like four million pounds of chicken that had been inspected. By the end of that year, over 8 million pounds of chicken had been recalled from major producers. In 2018 alone, there were 34 poultry recalls from the large producers. Remember, in over 50 years, there wasn't a single reported health issue with any small farms that were processing poultry under the exemptions. But it didn't seem to move the needle much, and that suggested that, that safety wasn't fully the argument. Why was um, tiny little, uh, really unusual Hawkins Farm a threat? The opposing side was not only represented by state regulators, but also by large agricultural lobbying interests, including the Indiana Farm Bureau, the Indiana State Poultry Association, the Indiana Pork Producers Association, and the Indiana Beef and Cattle Association. At this point, we're dead in the water. But when you uncover really what happened here, and it took a while to figure this out. It's all about eliminating competition. So if at that time, the large poultry producers, they're very well organized, they saw a small farm that was operating legally to process chickens on the farm, that's competition to them. And so how is one farm gonna hurt these big producers of hundreds of thousands of birds, you know, uh, a year? or more, it's because they don't want one farm, two farms, 100 farms, 500 farms, 1,000 farms. So the other thing is the value system associated with raising food locally, humane, drug-free, stress-free, you know where your food comes from, that gets people questioning a lot about what happens in industrial agriculture. It might be a use regulation to stifle competition thing. Nobody's declared that, you know. So draw what conclusions you will. The social media campaign continued to create enormous public pressure. So local politicians took a closer look without the influence of the agricultural lobbyists. Small farm owners were invited to meet with state agencies to redraft the bill. They brought us together with the Board of Animal Health and the Department of Health and kind of said, you know what, what can we do to make this better? Is there a creative solution here? Remarkably, a revised bill was drafted to everyone's satisfaction. And then that bill did pass. Uh, so we are, yeah, we're under a new kind of regulation, but one that feels appropriate to what we're trying to do here. Right. It went from the worst form of government to try to put somebody out of business to actually an example how government works when you have the right people in place on all sides and you're willing to listen and kind of find common ground. We were braced for things to unfold the way they usually unfold, you know, for the small farm to lose the battle. But 
because people joined in the process, people called their representatives, they shared our story online, and um, I think that was to the surprise of everyone involved. Despite the efforts of large agricultural interests, the state government and local farm owners found a solution. In fact, the regulations were improved to better suit small farms while maintaining high safety standards. Now, restaurants like Pete Eshelman's can continue to serve locally sourced poultry, and neighbors have a choice in the food that they eat. <laughs> If you think that serious agricultural reform isn't possible, let me share the example of New Zealand. Up until the early 1980s, New Zealand farmers were generously subsidized, until the point that a third or more of farm income came from the central government. But in the mid-1980s, radical reforms virtually eliminated subsidies and opened up the world market. Many farmers struggled at first, but the end result is that New Zealand farmers increased their output. And New Zealand is now one of the most efficient agricultural producers in the world. I think there's hope, especially on farm subsidies. I think there is a bipartisan understanding that this is wrong. And there are people on both sides of the aisle who are talking about getting rid of farm subsidies. Sometimes subsidies, like those in the Farm Bill, grow and grow over the decades until they become almost impossible to remove. But new corporate welfare programs can also spring up impulsively. This happened in 2008 in response to a housing crisis. The government acted very quickly to manage an economic meltdown. But did it act wisely? And should it have acted at all? Today, fear on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange as investors worried the country is in the midst of an economic crisis unlike anything seen Markets in decades. Markets around the world are coming off the worst week since the crash of 1929. In 2020, an unprecedented pandemic caused a global economic crisis. Before that, the world also experienced a crisis in the crash of 2008. Major investment firms failed, housing foreclosures skyrocketed, and millions lost their jobs. The government played a unique role in both the cause and reaction to that crash. Have any lessons been learned? In 2008, John Allison was CEO of BB&T, one of the 25 largest banks in the country. Nobody in my family had ever graduated from college. Being a professor got me very interested in finance, and that's how I ended up going in the banking business. I became CEO in 1989. We were four and a half billion dollars in assets, and we had grown to 152 billion dollars in assets. Uh, during my tenure as CEO. Today, Allison is retired as CEO. He's an author, an educator, and often lectures on the lessons to be learned from the 2008 crisis. I wish in a way I had a more fun subject to talk about than the financial crisis, but it's actually a very important subject. Whether you know it or not because of your age, I am sure it had an impact on your family and your family's friends. It was a dramatic event, a very dramatic event. And if we draw the wrong conclusions, we're going to make the same mistakes again. And the thing that hurt people the most was in the housing market. Part of the origins of the crisis can be traced back to Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae, a pair of federally created lending institutions. In the early 1990s, President Clinton demanded that they start having half their loans in what was called affordable housing, now called subprime lending. And a lot of economists said, wow, that's risky. With the backing of government lenders and financial institutions, banks dramatically increased their number of subprime loans given to people with low credit ratings. Soon it became much too easy for people to borrow more than they could afford. Making what the government called affordable housing loans, which actually were unaffordable to the borrowers, became a big business. 
risky mortgages. Those loans are expected to cost two million people their homes before it's all done. I should never even been offered this mortgage. It's a subprime mortgage. It's a lifetime invested here. It's just like a, it's a nightmare. Predictably, as more money came into the housing market due to the subprime loans, housing prices went up. So the prices got so high, they had to break. And when they broke, it's when the, when the big correction happened. This morning at the opening bell, the Dow took a steep dive in what seemed for a time like near panic selling. In 2008, we really needed an economic correction because we'd overinvested in housing. What we didn't need was a crisis. And the crisis was almost totally created by government's arbitrary handling of problem situations. Unfortunately, a number of large banks made mistakes, and if I'd been in charge, I'd have let them fail. But the government didn't want these big banks to go broke because of the cronyism that exists in our economy. Not since the Great Depression has the federal government stepped in to help a failing financial institution in this country the way they did over this past weekend. For example, the first company that, that got in trouble was Bear Stearns. They were nice people who'd made some bad mistakes, uh, but they certainly were not critical of the marketplace. The marketplace was stunned when the Federal Reserve essentially bailed out Bear Stearns. And then later on, Lehman Brothers, which was much more important than Bear Stearns, got in financial trouble. They allowed it to fail. Sunday night, a sign of the extraordinary times on Wall Street as thousands of Lehman Brothers bankers packed their boxes. The market believed that Paulson, who was Secretary of Treasury, had a lot of animosity against Lehman Brothers. These government bureaucrats can just make it up however they want to make it up. But how do you deal with there's no rule of law? And that's what took a correction and turned it into a crisis. Government interventions became chaotic. Wachovia was essentially taken over by the Federal Reserve and sold to Citigroup. But everybody in the market knew that Citigroup was in more financial trouble than Wachovia. Because this is crazy. You're selling a bad bank to a worse bank. How's that supposed to work out? And a few days later, they ended up selling Wachovia to Wells Fargo. They just reneged on a legal contract they had signed with Citigroup. They just said, sorry, we're out of it. The American taxpayer has been asked to take on a big burden all at once. $700 billion to shore up a financial system on the verge of collapse. A lot of people have heard about what's called the bank bailout. It's technically called the TARP program. The reason healthy banks were forced to take TARP is Bernanke, who was head of the Federal Reserve, was afraid that if he just bailed out the bad banks, that would mark those banks. So he very much wanted the healthy banks to participate so it looked like a bailout of the industry instead of a bailout of banks. And the good banks, like BB&T, would be painted with the same brush as the bad institutions. All banks were forced to take a bailout loan from the government, whether they needed it or not. This policy hid which banks had made poor financial decisions. In bb ts case, we didn't need the money. We had to pay a very high interest rate, and the net cost is between 50 and $100 million for money we did not need and did not want. The myth that uh, deregulation and Read on Wall Street caused the financial crisis and the government stepped in and saved the economy is not true. Unfortunately, government policies which had good intentions, you know, like affordable housing, created very bad outcomes. When government starts interfering with market processes, it often produces very bad results, even when their intentions sound good. So we've seen how the federal government's good intentions can have terrible results. But what happens when government officials decide to fully step out of the way and deregulate an industry? That's exactly what happened in 1980. Uh, I've had this truck since uh, 2014, and I've put about 600,000 miles on it. And then I bought my first rig in uh, September. I'll never forget the date. September the 3rd, 1983 was the day that I realized my dream and bought my first truck. 
Hi. Hi, Carl Smith. Joe Norbert. Nice to meet you. Good to meet you, too. I started in business back in uh, 1983, and they had just deregulated the trucking industry to where now uh, small-time operators like me could and be in a small trucking business for themselves. Before 1980, it would have been virtually impossible for Carl to start his own trucking business. That's because of the Motor Carrier Act of 1935, which put the government in complete control of the trucking industry. The industry was regulated both in terms of where you could go and how much you could charge. Our rates were set through rate bureaus. You operated on the roads that were approved. There were bureaucratic limitations and inefficiencies, such as forcing truckers to make long, empty backhauls. But overall, the established trucking companies and unions were happy with the arrangement. They knew that there would be guaranteed profits and jobs, and it would be almost impossible for a new startup to compete. So it was a good deal for the companies, and it was something that uh, we were loath to change. The Motor Carrier Act of 1980 fully deregulated trucking. The truck deregulation legislation will get the heavy hand of the federal government out of the area of the uh, private uh, sector. It'll mean uh, new opportunities and new jobs. And it was devastating to the existing industry. But I think it's something that had to happen. After it was deregulated, it allowed for a smaller, uh, less established uh, individual like me to get into the industry and earn a good living. Morning, man. Morning, Misty. What are you doing today, man? Hey, uh, we have a load picking up today at 3 p.m., delivering uh, Tuesday at 8 a.m. into Timminsville, South Carolina. That's the Honda ATV plant, right? Yes, sir. This is a compressed trailer or a liquid tanker? A liquid tanker. Uh, as the years went on, I bought uh, another truck here, another truck there. Till at one point, I was up to 11 trucks operating a small fleet out of Ohio. Deregulation led to a substantial shift in the industry. Many more small outfits, like cars, gained a competitive foothold. Over 40 of the larger regulated trucking companies went out of business but some adapted and still operate today. Someone might ask, you know, why when you lose, you know, 40 or 50 companies that went out of business after deregulation, why is that a good thing? That's a good thing because the consumers are getting a better service and product as a result of that. And uh, when a company goes down, that freight is still moving. So some other company is going to be pick that up. Are those companies going to need employees to help handle that freight? Well, of course they are. So many of those people who, who indeed lost their jobs as a result of company failure, they're working for our other organization. But the good thing is, is that industry is still highly regulated as it pertains to safety. What's not regulated is who can and cannot be in this industry. And I think that's a better uh, deal for everybody. Uh, we sent all four of our children to college and we've actually lived a, a pretty decent life. I'm one of those people that I knew what I wanted to be when I was 12 years old. I wanted to be a truck driver. Others told me that I had a lot more potential to do other things, but I said, that's really what I want to do. I'm one of the lucky ones. I got to do what I wanted to do. Initially, deregulation in the trucking industry was tumultuous. But in the end, the American consumer benefited from lower shipping costs and more efficient service. And new truckers like Carl could enter the industry and make their mark. Thank you so much for sharing your story and spending time with me today. Thank you, John. This has been great. Take care. Here in America, government regulation becomes corporate welfare. When big companies successfully lobby Washington, D.C., with the goal of shutting out their competition or to get special protections. And the politicians are no better. Regardless of political party, their campaigns are usually funded by these special interests. And this is how they return the favor. So the question is, who is lobbying for the taxpayer? The answer is no one.
excessive government business collusion is not good for America. Some feel the problem lies with big business. Others, that it lies with big government. But either way you look at it, the problem can be beat. In the end, it's the government that creates and enforces law. So focusing on policy change and the law is critical. Jeff and Zach Hawkins fought the state government with a social media campaign. Yves Baton Rouge fought for a seat at the subsidy decision-making table and won. In both cases, public exposure was key in changing how their state governments operated. And it also takes brave politicians, like those in New Zealand, who completely reformed their agricultural system to become a world leader without subsidies. Or those in the US who deregulated the trucking industry. What I've observed on the ground in country after country and certainly here in America, is that it's better to let the economy evolve in its own natural way, bumps and all, rather than to rely on government intervention. As we've seen, when Big Brother decides to help big business, the cure is often more harmful than the disease. I'm Joel Norbert. Thanks for watching. Corporate Welfare, Where's the Outrage, is now available on DVD. For more information or to order a DVD of this program, call 1-800-876-8930 or visit www.freetochoose.net. Funding for this program has been provided by Sarah Scaife Foundation. Melvin S. Cohen Foundation, Family Mullenkamp Charitable Fund of the Pittsburgh Foundation. Welcome back. We sure hope you enjoyed that film. Uh, again, can continue to keep the questions and chat box going all you'd like there. There's over 600 people registered for this. So if we don't get to all the questions, I'll apologize for that. But we do have your emails if you've signed up. So I'll try to get some answers to questions if we're not able to get to them here. I want to start this off with a question for Joan, which is asked often. So it's worth repeating. Joan, why is a Swede interested in this? It's America. Why, why, are, you, why are you sticking your nose into this thing? <laughs> that's that's not a bad question. Uh, why do I bother? Uh, well, to me, the main reason is that, I mean, I care about what happens in most places, but things that happen in America tends to have an effect on the rest of the world in, in several different ways. And anything that's harmful to the ideals of the United States and to its economy has a detrimental effect on liberty and prosperity around the world. If people begin to think that the, the American model is unfair, unjust, doesn't give people a chance, the American dream is dead, then people will look to other models around the world. And if, for example, corporate welfare has a detrimental effect on economic growth and productivity and, and innovation, people will look for other models around the world. So. It's really in, in Sweden's self-interest that uh, uh, the United States works out well. Good. And continuing on that phrase there, at the end of the film, you had said, uh, you know, some people blame big government, others blame big business. How convenient. Neither one's held accountable. Uh, should we put the blame on one or the other, Joan, and which one should we put it on? Well, in a way, everybody just reacts to the incentives that they got uh, the incentives to be popular, to get votes or revenue and, and incomes and uh, make it in the market. Uh, so I'm not much of a blame anyone guy. Uh, I'm more like we've ended up in a very nasty equilibrium over here where politicians do things and businesses do things that actually harm uh, the um, the economy, it harms the taxpayers, it harms the competition, and therefore also productivity and innovation. Um, you know, businesses, they do what they have to do to uh, survive in the competition. And if governments hand out free money, obviously they'll 
they'll go for it. And I don't really moralize uh, about that. Um, but it would be good if if government stopped handing out welfare like that. How about you, John Allison? You going to put the blame on someone? Yeah, I think it's primarily the responsibility of government. I mean, they're the people that have the money, right? Uh, it's, it's not that businesses don't ask for it, but the fact that the government gives it to them. And of course, in the United States, I would argue that the whole uh, corporate welfare is clearly unconstitutional. Yet somebody has to show me where, where the government is authorized to do that uh, in the United States. I don't think it is anywhere. And so I, I primarily blame government, but in a certain sense, I guess it gets back to the voters who vote for people that give gifts away. Uh, you know, they elect people that get the gifts right. away, and, and that's a problem. I think the best thing we can do is expose it so people understand. I don't think it, I happen to be in the banking business and saw the magnitude of corporate welfare, and it's stunning. And I, I would also say this in defend this, the defense of corporations. A lot of it happens because of government policy. There were a lot of companies like Amazon that tried to avoid the government like a you know a passion, and the government came after them. And so they ended up hiring a bunch of lobbyists, and now they're doing out money to politicians. Mm -hmm. And if you look at most of the big companies that, that are involved in, in uh, buying votes in a certain sense, uh, it's because they were forced to. Walmart was very opposed to getting involved with the government at all, and the government came after them. And so they responded by getting a, a whole bunch of uh, of lobbyists and doling out money to the politicians. And, and I think John points at uh, uh, John, please. Yeah, I think that's a very good point because many companies start out thinking that we won't be like those other guys in the gray suits mm -hmm. and walking down the corridors of, of power and they stay out. And especially in Silicon Valley, that was a sort of a sense of pride in not being yeah. one of those whispering in the ears of politicians. But they found out that when they weren't there, somebody else was and they lost out and they were beat up by uh, by the corridors of power. And, and for their own self-interest, they had to go there. So obviously, if that's the rules of the game, they're going to have to adapt to it, unfortunately. I'm happy to point out, by the way, in the title of the film, Corporate Welfare, Where's the Outrage? And John Allison was an advisor to us on this project. And we, we agreed that that's what we needed to call it, was corporate welfare, so that people sort of knew, look, the business can't do this on their own. It's a welfare program, and who gives out welfare payments, if you will? That comes from the government side of the equation. But, John, this next question comes from uh, the, the host at Good Morning Liberty's podcast. And they said, hey, listen, we're capitalists, right? But I thought the goal of our corporations was to reduce costs. So what's wrong with me going after special tax breaks, John? Well, I, <laughs> I, in a certain sense, I really don't blame businesses for going after special tax breaks. I do blame them for paying, you know, giving money to politicians so they can get special ta uh, uh, tax breaks. I think that's wrong. I think it undermines the, the the confidence that the general population has in businesses. And I think it's very dangerous because if you look at the recent surveys, the majority of college graduates, recent college graduates, think socialism is better than capitalism. That is incredibly dangerous. And I think it's because they think capitalism is something different than it is. <laughs> they believe it's about the government giving money to big businesses. And, and that's, that is actually not capitalism at all. So I think that we are undermining capitalism, and that is the biggest threat versus the money we give away. But if if the majority of young people over time become socialists, we'll end up with a socialist economy, and that'll have huge negative uh, consequences for the quality of life in the U.S. John, how about you? Uh, should co corporations, and you're a multinational guy, I know this here, you look at all, all these in here, in corporations, do, do they look at tax breaks in terms of where they're going to locate? Is that the right thing to do? And should they be going after these tax breaks? Well, I mean, again, I won't moralize if that's the rule of the game. It's difficult to play by, by other rules, and I certainly understand why they have a duty and an obligation to to their shareholders to at least not um, commit suicide by principle. <laughs> mm -hmm. But at the same time, 
I do think that we all have to understand that we we all make the world as we go through it. And if we reinforce the game, if we strengthen it and if we lobby for it, um, then we are part of the problem. And then in that case, I, I think that there is a reason why business is reason why we could say that businesses are often making it worse. And I think that sometimes you have to think about your longer term self-interest as well, because the system changes if you change the system in, in that direction. And what many businesses have learned is that if they ask for a helping hand, that often comes with certain conditions and uh, and certain obligations from the government and they get that helping hand but they might end up tied behind their backs with, with both their their arms eventually because then people say well we gave them that we they had that bailout they have this tariff protection this subsidy well shouldn't do, they do things that are in the interest of the present political majority here and there whereby they lose the freedom that they need to navigate to the places where they would be most productive. So it might be short-term self-interest that loses out uh, in the long run. Excellent there. Uh, next question, either one of you can chime in for this one here, but if you could start at just one place, that one subsidy to eliminate, the one special tax break that would actually send the biggest message that people want to do something, what, what would you guys pick? I would probably pick agriculture uh, because it's, you know, kind of visible. People think it's good, but they have no idea that this huge, massive subsidies are going to a handful of large corporations, not to your traditional family farm. And I think that would be an interesting message. I, I'm not you know, who knows what the best message would be. I think that would be a very powerful message. And the irony is, of course, as, as John said about the New Zealand, I think you'd see a big cut in agricultural costs and prices. I think subsidies lead to massive misinvestment. And, uh, and the worst example in the U.S. is the sugar. Right. Why does the U.S. pay more for sugar? I mean, of all the things. And that is 100% political. You know, there's no reason... In fact, I expect you could cut sugar prices 75%. I mean, and you got sugar in many, many products. So the price of food is significantly impacted by subsidies to one company. And I consider that immoral, wrong, and uh, very, I, I consider it disgusting to tell you the truth. It reminds me of when the government subsidizes tobacco production and then also <laughs> runs advertisements that you shouldn't be smoking. So, you know, there's, I, I, I've always wondered that. John, what do you think? What's what's the one place you'd start? Well, actually, John's idea is not uh, bad. Uh, and, you know, uh, the, the corn subsidies, um, where lots of it go into high fructose corn syrup and sweeteners, is that really something that the taxpayers <laughs> should subsidize and then subsidize the health cost of people eating it all the time as well? Uh, <laughs> I think that would be a good place to go. Uh, another idea uh, would be to actually borrow uh, from one of the good things that have been done in the European Union. Uh, it's not been perfectly implemented by no means, but at least there is the rule that you have to abide by if you uh, are a member of the European Union that you're really not allowed to subsidize particular companies. And there are lots of gray zones there. There are lots of different interpretations. And obviously, the lobbyists find ways of, of getting past it. But the, the basic rule is there. You can't do anything in favor of one particular company. If you give them anything, a tax break, a subsidy, a tariff barrier, um, you have to give it to other companies like that, even other European companies from other countries. Um, and. And that's at least a starting point, because that gives us a tool whereby we can examine what goes on and compare it to what the rule says and often actually block what is going on. And something like that, some sort of interstate compact in, in the U.S. to ban um, 
particular subsidies for for individual businesses. And, and John, you know, you've done a lot of commercial lending, John. A question from the audience here is, I mean, is and I'm rephrasing this here. Is agriculture a different business, though? I don't think so. I mean, yeah, we want to eat, but yeah. but we're going to have farmers and they're going to produce food. I mean, I, I started out as a farm lender, so I have a real appreciation for that business. I, but we had smaller farms in those days and they did a really good job. I, I think if anything, agricultural production would go up, not down. I think that that's a total misconception. Subsidies cause people to make bad decisions because they get focused on the subsidy instead of the production. And you saw that, I mean, the trucking industry is a classic example. Mm -hmm. Trucks are far more efficient than they were when they were being subsidized. Airlines, far more efficient than when they were being subsidized. And I think we'd have more food at lower prices. <laughs> in fact, I'm certain of it if right. we didn't have the subsidies. I, I want to follow up. You mentioned the tobacco industry. I uh, my bank was primarily a tobacco bank when I went to work for an interesting world. And uh, what was interesting, the government paid people to grow tobacco. Then they paid them to sell it to the government. because <laughs> And then they bought it and stored it and sold it cheap to somebody. I mean, it was, it was one of the craziest programs of all time. Thank goodness they finally got rid of it. And the, the way they got rid of it, which I thought was crazy, they paid the people that had the had been getting these subsidies for years a tremendous amount of money to buy them out of their subsidies. Yeah, they to stop that. farming. Yeah, but but well, of course they they didn't yeah. quit farming. They started growing something that you people could eat and live with. But mm -hmm. it was good that they did get rid of those subsidies. Now most of those farmers, by the way, started growing sweet potatoes, and sweet potatoes are incredibly nutritious for you. So they went from growing something that's horrible for you to something that's very good for you. And, they, and you know. Joe, and question from the audience here, uh, and uh, I'll repeat this one here. How do we fight back against one-sided economic benefit sub-studies, which always seem to conclude that corporate welfare is good? <laughs> well, yes, it's. You know, there's this great French 19th century economist that I keep coming back to and keep telling everybody to read. Just one simple essay. It's short, but it'll give you a worldview by which you can see through all those stupid studies in the future. And that's Frédéric Bastiat and his essay, What is Seen and What is Not Seen. And yes, it's so easy for politicians, for only capitalists and for lobbyists to say, look, the subsidy worked. We managed to expand. We managed to hire more people. Look, isn't it great? Yes, that's what's seen. That's what you can see because the benefits of a subsidy or a tariff, that's it's immediately visible. It has an effect um, that's concentrated in time and in, in geography as well. Whereas you have to keep in mind what is not seen. How would these resources been, would have been used if they wouldn't have been diverted into this particular business? Well, people wouldn't have sort of thrown them into the river. <laughs> they would have used the, this purchasing power would have been there. The value with, by which you could invest would have been there. The only thing is that you've just diverted those resources from where the market, the millions of, of investors, businesses, and consumers would have put them and replaced that with the decision of a couple of politicians and a couple of lobbyists. And why would they know better where to put it? So, <laughs> yes, it's always easy to go to a particular plant and show people it worked. And that's why, as Bastia said, what is not seen has to be um, at least predicted by looking at economic theory and at history and at what goes on in the rest of the economy. And if you keep that in mind, you'll see through all those arguments. I, I was just reinforced that Bastiak's a great economist. Maybe the, in many ways, one of the best economists of all times. I would agree with that. And there is a Bastiak society in a lot of places, those of you that are interested in free markets. In fact, I spoke to the one in Raleigh, I think it's last, the weekend before last, and it's uh, you might want to join one. It's a great, <laughs> great group of people trying to defend free markets. 
A couple of housekeeping notes, by the way. So in the chat box, uh, somebody had asked here, can I see this program later and even this conversation? And yeah, the, so there's a link to the Crowdcast. So you can access this Crowdcast in the future. If you want to share the Crowdcast with somebody else, there's a link up there. I just wanted to point it out that uh, uh, in the film, we were, um, we were talking about farm subsidies in New Zealand. Joe and Norberg had uh, filmed uh, something for us called Trailblazers. It was a story of New Zealand. Uh, that film, the entire film, is available on our website at freetochoosenetwork.org. A little commercial for us right there. Um, Joe, and another question that popped in from the audience here, though, is take a look at Ireland. In, in, with regards to the low tax structure that they put in place, is that a different form of corporate welfare, if you will, used to lure businesses? Is that a good thing, bad thing, if we're talking about good and bad corporate welfare? That's a very good question, and I'll, I'll respond to that uh soon. I'll just say something about New Zealand. Uh, you might want to check New Zealand, especially if you're interested in this story about uh, agriculture and agricultural subsidies, because exactly what, what John said about how subsidies distort behavior. Instead of farmers doing what they think is the best use of their time, of the, the soil, the, the animals, instead you're going to have to look at what do the bureaucrats tell me to do. And they ended up with uh, something that one farmer called, uh, who talked to me, called uh, a skinny sheep policy, because <laughs> they they love sheep, so they subsidize them. If you have more sheep, you get more money. So they realized that okay, let's just get more sheep and let's not feed them because that's costly. We just want the subsidies. So they ended up with these skinny sheep that they didn't have much use for, not much meat or, or wool, but lots of subsidies. And the farmers hated it because that's not, if, if you are an independent farmer who went into that uh, kind of, of, of life because you, you love farming, it's awful to sort of become this kind of civil servant just uh, um, doing what, what politicians tell you. And getting rid of that, that was a boom for for. Um, New Zealand's farms. So, and I put I put in the chat box uh, also. So we, Joan not only does documentary films for us, we've also put them in the classroom space. And uh, is, or is it org uh, uh, releases and produces for uh, the classroom space. And there's a video called "No More Skinny Sheep," which we did <laughs> with uh, with Joan for the New Zealand thing there. But back to that EU question, Joan and the Ireland thing. I think it's a really interesting question. Yes, it is. Um, so from one. Uh, free market island to, to another one, from New Zealand to Ireland. Uh, this is a very good question, and this is a very important distinction, uh, because Ireland does not, at least not as a rule, uh, provide any particular tax exemptions for certain businesses that they happen to like. No particular subsidies it might happen in other places, parts of the economy. But that's not what the low corporate tax rate is about. That's about them saying that we want to have a hospitable business climate for all businesses, no matter what you do, no matter whether you're uh, Irish or American or Swedish, no matter if you're well connected politically or not, um, then you'll get the 12.5% corporate tax uh, rate uh, rather than anything else. And that has been really benefited uh, the, the Irish economy. And I think they have much more revenue from corporate taxes because of the low rate in, in that instance. And, and that's different from a particular subsidy where politicians pick winners and decide who gets what and then block everybody else from doing this. And it's different. It's lower, a lower tax rate than uh, most other countries have. And that's a good thing because that's a competition between different institutions because not every institution is alike. Many taxes are too high. So then let countries allow them to experiment with another tax rate, with another regulatory setting, and then let's see what works and creates the most benefits for, for their countries. And then hopefully we can imitate the best ones. You know, there have been a bunch of academic studies shown that corporate taxes are just taxes on consumers. It, it, it may impact shareholders a little bit, maybe employees, but it's primarily a tax on the consumer because the employ Corporations got to have a satisfactory return on equity, particularly in a global market where we enter it can't raise capital, can't stay in business. So, at the end of the day, corporations pass along tax increases. So, this, for example, this new tax program that the government's working yes. on now, 
corporation, they might pay it the first year, but after that, consumers are going to pay it. So it's really a tax on consumers disguised as a tax on corporations because of political considerations. Yeah, we've we've noted, you know, if Boeing doesn't pay corporate taxes. American Airlines and United, et cetera, pay the tax for them when they purchase the plane. And then American and United are going to pass that on right along to the consumer and the price of the airline ticket. There's there's never really a corporate tax that's paid yeah. by a corporation. At the end, some consumer is, is the, the beneficiary of that fine taxation policy. So. Um, and John, you're you're uh, I'll put you on the spot a little bit here because you're up on things in terms of this this concept of this new global minimum tax rate, if you will. Is that something you'd like to speak on for a moment? Well, uh, if they would leave it low like they started out, it's basically the same tax rate as in Ireland. I don't think it would be that destructive, but I think it actually will be very destructive because they can get together and raise the tax rate. And I don't think it'll take them long. I mean, it's kind of like when the when the uh, the change in the Constitution was approved that allowed the income tax. It started out with a maximum. I mean, a maximum of ten percent. It wasn't long till it was up to ninety percent. Hopefully, we won't do that kind of crazy thing on a global tax rate. I I am adamantly, personally opposed to a global tax rate, not because the original proposal is that bad, but that's not never how you start. <laughs> I, I think I think they'll you'll see fairly shortly that minimum raise and that'll hurt the people like Ireland that have done such a great job because they've had low taxes. It's funny and going to what John, John had just said, why don't we learn from Ireland? I mean, you know, why don't we learn from that stuff? I don't know. It's strange to me. I'm going to try to end this with a question. It's going to be open-ended question, but it's the one that comes up the most here. And it's essentially, what can we as the citizens do uh, about this? You know, as I said, people, uh, you know, I've, I've seen some things in the comment, the chat box of, well, there's great, there's no solutions here. We haven't got anything there. What, what you know, and I'll start with you, Jones. I think you start to highlight some of these in the film itself. That's a great question. And that's actually why we did this whole thing. Um, we wonder where is the outrage, uh, because we know what the political solution is. It's it's fairly simple. Uh, politicians just have to stop doing certain things, and we also know how they could go about it. Uh, but how do you get them to do it? How do you get voters to react? Well, there's just one answer, and that's transparency, uh, knowledge, because we learned while we were on this project that there's plenty of outrage the moment people hear about it that's exactly with the baton rouge tax exemptions uh the the hawkins family farm it's so easy for um the lobbyists and the politicians to just continue doing their work as long as we don't know about it but the moment people hear what's going on they don't like their pockets being picked and especially not by those who really don't need to to pick pockets to to uh, survive um so spread the word spread the message that's why we did this documentary that's why we talk about this constantly that's why we write about it and if you want to be part of that solution do that spread the message uh, this documentary talk to people about it go to things like sort of the local budgets available online mostly nowadays. If it's not demand transparency, there are institutions like the Sunlight Foundation who really sh sh shines a spotlight on what's going on. And the moment that happens, there's outrage. And then suddenly politicians, the, the rules of the game is changed because then politicians don't benefit from doing this. They are hurt when they uh, engage in corporate welfare. So more of that, please. Very good. John, your, your thoughts. I, I totally agree. I mean, that is absolutely the solution is to, I think if people, you know, one of the things that happened to me, I spent three years in Washington working for Cato. And also before that I'd ran a bank. So I, I could, I couldn't believe how horrible a lot of this stuff was. And, and, and if you tell people a lot of times they really, they go, no, it's not like that. It was worse than people know. So I think the most important thing we can do is get transparency. And Absolutely. Take this, give this program to people. Uh, give it to your congressman. 
I mean, I think the congressman would be petrified if people started really learning. I mean, there are a few congressmen that don't do some pretty crazy things from a long-term economic perspective, uh, but they're, they're few and far between. The most of them have done some really bad stuff from a public policy perspective in regards to taxes. And, mm -hmm. and uh, so I think letting them know, I mean, even one person let them know <laughs> that somebody knows what they're doing. <laughs> it's, it's a start. It's I, a start. I think, as I said, you know, awareness is the number one thing. As I said, you have to make everybody aware of the issue. Once people are aware that it's out there, then, as I said, there's nobody that ever, I, I have yet to hear a conversation where people say, you know, we really need to give more money from the poor and the middle class to the wealthy. You know, when we talk about income redistribution, I actually have never heard that that comment before. Yet we we it's all over in terms of corporate welfare. I want to give a tip of the hat also to John and John, if you want to take a minute, because I think leadership by business is another area. And John, what did your bank do with regards to eminent domain? Um, I think leadership by business is critically important, and I, it disappoints me a lot of times how businesses don't. In fact, they actually give in and support a lot of this bad stuff. In regards to eminent domain, uh, first, let me be sure everybody understands what eminent domain is. Eminent domain is where the government can take your property, not for a public good, but for the good of individual companies. Um, the Supreme Court ruled that eminent domain, where property is taken from one private company and given to another private uh, company or private individual, given... Uh, was, was constitutional, which we were stunned at the time, because I, yeah. I'm stunned to this day, because I don't think it is constitutional. I don't even think it's close. But anyway, when that uh, decision was made, we made an announcement that we would not finance any projects where uh, eminent domain was used to take the property of a private individual and give it to or sell it to a big corporation. And, and some companies like IKEA were very guilty of doing that. Uh, at the time, we actually didn't know what the consequences would be. We knew we'd lose some business. Uh, municipalities, for example, were using eminent domain to quote attract business at the expense of other businesses in those municipalities. But what we were stunned by is that thousands thousands of individuals wrote us and said gosh i can't believe a business will stand on principle that, that we're going to move our checking account to bbnt and we had never really done it because we expected it to you know get that kind of publicity and what was ironic to me and i think really disappointing i wrote the ceos of several large banks who i knew personally and say look we if every bank stands up for this, it'll be over because they, they can't execute it. And not a single one of them would follow us. Yeah. And, and that's, I found uh, that disappointing. Mm -hmm. As I said, I think leadership is, is just another one of those components there. Uh, we've reached just about the end of our time, but I want to put a couple of commercials into the chat box for a second with regards to what's next for these fine gentlemen, by the way. As I said, you can see Corporate Welfare, Where's the Outrage at our website, free to choose network.org. You can also see the original 10-hour Milton Friedman series, free to choose, and all of our other productions here. But uh, uh, John Allison is going to be on a panel at the Federal Society. I shouldn't even say a panel. John Allison is going to be debating uh, at the famed, I think it's called the Rosencrantz debate uh, on the, the topic of concentrated corporate power is a greater threat to individual freedom than government power. John will take the side of the good guys. And Joe Norberg, uh, famous for his series web series with us called Dead Wrong for about four years, Joan is now uh, going to be releasing a new series with us in November called Joe Norberg's New and Improved. So we'd love it if you signed up for Free to Choose Network's YouTube channel, where you will automatically be subscribed to receive uh, future things from Joe and John and Joe. And I want to thank you so much for your time uh, that you put into this project. And as I said, this is going to have a long shelf life. I don't see this going away anytime too soon. So uh, we look forward to the people who are on this call here helping us spread the message. Thank you so much. Thank you.